one of the most popular use cases for serverless is APIs. Those APIs can be used to serve data to your line of business applications, mobile apps, and other services. My name is David Barkle, and I'm part of the Cloud Native Global Black Belt team at Microsoft. In this video, we are going to look at using both Azure Functions and API management for serverless APIs. Let's dive right in. The plan is to start with a high-level overview of Azure Functions. This will include a discussion on the programming model as well as what makes it serverless. The next topic will be the API Gateway Pattern, which will set the table for how you can manage, scale, and even protect your APIs with Azure API Management. I plan on providing a deeper look at policies and scope with the Azure API Gateway, and we'll wrap it up with some key takeaways. Let's start with a very quick introduction to Azure Functions. At the core of Functions are events, and this event-driven model for how your code is invoked. These events can be anything from a scheduled timer, a HTTP request, or even a new message in a service bus queue or topic. This event, or even better yet, this trigger, acts as a contract between your code and the Azure Functions runtime to determine how to run and scale your service. The code you provide to react to the event can be written in the language of your choice. This includes C-sharp, JavaScript, Python, Java, and many more. Bindings, both input and output, allow you to pull in data, as well as write data out to a number of services. For example, an existing document might be updated in Cosmos DB, which could trigger my function and provide me context on the document in the form of an input binding. My function could then perform some business logic and upon completion, publish a message to a queue. The plumbing of working with those services, both Cosmos DB and Service Bus, is done for you. You simply focus on the business logic. Now the best part of all this, in my opinion, is that during this process, you are not concerned with or responsible for provisioning, patching, scaling, or managing any of the underlying infrastructure. Your function will scale when needed and scale down when it is done. As long as you are running under the consumption plan for Azure Functions, you will only pay for the amount of time your code runs. This billing model, along with the on-demand scale and event-driven approach, are what makes all of this serverless. I wanna take a quick moment and talk a little bit about the programming model around Azure Functions. In this example, we're looking at an HTTP triggered function. The file is called function.json, and it contains all the information for the function trigger, its bindings, and other configuration. Notice how the type is set to HTTP trigger, and the direction is set to in. Also notice that for this function, I only want to support the get method. If I wanted to, I could add other verbs such as post, put, delete, patch, and so on. Lastly, notice the output binding of this configuration. It is also set to HTTP with the direction set to out. The code for your function, especially for an HTTP triggered one, should be quick, simple, and ideally do one thing. I put together this simple example just to show you what the programming model looks like for an HTTP function written in JavaScript. One of my favorite things about Azure Functions is the developer experience. Here, I'm running Visual Studio Code and have already installed the extension, which will allow me to create new projects, run and debug your code, and even deploy to Azure. In this demo, we'll look at two Azure Function projects one written in JavaScript and the other in C-sharp. I'm going to use the same projects along with API management to show how the two services complement each other when building serverless APIs. Let's take a look at some code. The reviews project contains one function called getReviews. It returns a collection of product reviews. The configuration settings show that the function is configured with an HTTP trigger the get method, and a route called reviews. Let's run the function and see it in action. Now 
I'm going to use an extension called REST Client to send a request to the function and hit my breakpoint. This development experience is really cool. I'm able to test and run my function locally with the same runtime that runs in Azure. I can see things like the stack trace and even local variables. Here are the results from my request. Let's move on to the second function project called products. This project contains six unique functions written in C sharp. The configuration for each function is done by using code annotations. Notice how in this function, I'm able to declare the authorization level, the methods I want to support, and even a custom route with a parameter at the end. Let's run it and see it in action. Using the same REST client, I will invoke one of the methods and step in. Pretty cool, eh? Now that we have some context about the APIs we want to use, let's talk about some of the challenges we face and how a service like API management can help. In the previous demo, we saw that using an Azure function with an HTTP trigger is a great solution for APIs. We looked at two function apps written in different languages. The first API returned product reviews, and the second supported CRUD operations for products. The programming model allows us to configure the authorization level, HTTP methods, and even customize the routes to make the APIs appear more REST friendly. When it comes to calling a single API from a consumer application, things are relatively easy. However, once we begin to introduce more APIs, integration becomes more complex, and we are met with some trade-offs. The first compromise that comes to mind is some coupling that occurs with the consumers and the APIs themselves. The consumer now needs to retain knowledge about each API and some of the nuances that differ between them. This can include different API keys, URLs, and specific knowledge about the data that each of them offer. This overhead is something we'd like to avoid, and we anticipate building more serverless APIs with Azure Functions. This brings us to a very helpful pattern called the API Gateway Pattern. We see this pattern leveraged quite a bit with microservices when trying to avoid direct client-to-service communication. In this diagram, API management is used as the single point of entry to route requests from the consumer applications to backend services. The backend APIs are hosted on Azure Functions, web apps, and even AKS. The gateway API management insulates the caller from those details and opens up a whole new set of possibilities. The API gateway pattern is much more than just a reverse proxy to those backend services. It's when you start to think about cross-cutting concerns that the gateway pattern really delivers impact. Some of those concerns include authentication. You might have APIs that have a different security profile. Perhaps one of them uses basic authentication while another isn't secured at all. You can enforce something like an API key or even a JSON web token that comes from Active Directory as part of the security scheme for those APIs when requests reach the gateway. Some other concerns include logging, throttling, and even SSL termination. The one I really like is caching. Being able to leverage a caching service like Redis, for example, could reduce the number of calls to my backend services if that data does not change often. This finally brings us to Azure API Management, which is a globally available service that allows you to abstract, secure, observe, and finally publish your APIs. And those APIs can run anywhere, including Azure and other clouds, and even on-premises. The serverless offering of API Management is known as the consumption tier. It aligns with the serverless concepts I mentioned earlier, which are on-demand scale, a consumption-based billing model, 
and an abstraction over the infrastructure, which means that we don't have to worry about capacity, availability, and the management overhead. API management together with Azure Functions completes the serverless API story. In addition to Azure Functions, a very common use case for API management is to place it in front of a logic app that uses an incoming HTTP request as its trigger. The logic app then runs to orchestrate tasks, business logic, and workflows. To the consumer, it appears as though they are calling just another API. Another interesting approach is to use it as a facade over other Azure services. I've seen customers take an incoming request at the gateway level and have that place an order into a message queue so that another service can then pick it up for later processing. This allows them to keep their backend workflow and services intact while expanding their reach with APIs. Let's dive in and see this in action. In this demo, we are finally going to start working with API management and functions to unify our backend services. I'm in the Azure portal, and the first thing I want to show you is that the functions we've reviewed earlier have been deployed and are ready for use. Here we have the reviews API with the single function get reviews. Next is the products API with the six functions underneath it. Let's look at what it takes to provision a new instance of API management. From the search bar, I'll actually type API management to see it show up in the marketplace. From there, all I need to do is give it a unique name select the consumption tier, and if I want, I can enable application insights for telemetry from the beginning. If not, I can add it later. That's all I really have to do to provision a consumption tier for API management. With my serverless instance of API management up and running, I can now begin to import and manage some APIs. I'll go to APIs and select function app as an option. From there, I'll browse to the products API that we looked at earlier. I'll select that and begin the importing process. What's really cool here is that you see a list of all the functions underneath that function app. I might not want to import every single operation. Actually, I think I want to remove the delete operations for this API. So I'll uncheck those, click select, and then give it a bit of more of a friendlier display name. After that, I'll click Create, and it'll import that API for me under API Management. There we go. There are the four operations I selected. Everything is looking good so far, but I want to test an operation just to make sure. From the Test tab, I'll pick Get Products by ID and select an ID parameter for the operation. Let's pick two. When I click Send, I see that I'm getting back the results that I expected. Let's try one more, change the ID to one, and try again. Okay, things are looking good. Now it's time to make some changes to this API. What I want to do next is add rate limiting to this operation, but I don't want to make it the default behavior just yet, and that's where revisions come in. I'll click on revisions and add a new one so I can add this change in a safe manner where only I can test it. So I'll call this Rev2 and click create. I'm currently in Rev2. I'll go back to that operation and I'm going to add a policy for rate limiting. In the inbound processing flow, I'll click on policies and make that change right before the backend service is called. So I'm going to say I can only call this operation two times within the duration of 10 seconds. Click save and then test it again. And I'm getting a 429 which is exactly what I expected. I'll test it a few more times and things are looking great. 
So I want to make this the current revision so that everybody else can take advantage of it too. I'll go back to revisions, select Rev2, and make that current. Revisions are a great way to introduce non-breaking changes to your API. They allow you to make changes safely and even roll back those changes if necessary. Now it's time to import and manage the Reviews API. As much as I like the Azure portal, I prefer to do most of my work in Visual Studio Code. So let's head over there now. Using the API Management extension for VS Code, I can look at my API Management instance. You'll notice here that we only have the products API so far. So I'll right click and say import from Azure Functions. And then bring in the reviews API. I'll check the operations that I want to include and click OK. Now that reviews has been imported, I can look at the operations and even test from VS Code. Looking good. We accomplished a lot during this demo. We imported and tested our APIs from the Azure portal and Visual Studio Code. We also added a policy and experimented with revisions. Let's take a closer look at policies and some of the other features of API management. Whenever I get a chance to work with API management, I usually spend my time configuring policies. Perhaps the best way to understand what policies are is to view them as a collection of statements that let you change the behavior of an API. Let's take the example of a legacy API that you imported into API management. Perhaps the team that built that service is no longer around, so updating the code base isn't an option. As it turns out, a few of the operations in that API return sensitive information that you no longer want to expose to your consumers. To solve this, you can apply a transformation policy to remove or obfuscate that information, like a social security number or address, before it leaves the gateway and is returned to the caller. The point is, you have a great collection of policies at your disposal. Take some time to explore them. This brings us to a very important topic around policies called scope. Understanding scope and where to apply certain policies is an extremely important concept for an API gateway. What I want to do now is walk you through a set of recommendations for specific policies and where you would most likely apply them. At the global level, we typically think about logging and allowing restricted access to resources who are calling our APIs from websites that are usually on another domain, otherwise known as cross-origin resource sharing, or CORS. For logging, there's an existing policy that allows you to asynchronously send all incoming requests to Azure Event Hubs, where you can look for anomalies and perform other activities. The next scope to consider is the product. A product is nothing more than a logical collection or grouping of APIs. APIs can be associated with multiple products. It's here that we think about rate limits and quotas. We might even create products that resemble a certain level of membership. Think bronze, silver, and gold status, for example. The API scope is comprised of a set of operations. And it's very common here to think about security. An extremely popular option is to expect an access token or JSON web token to be passed into the request. The JOT validation policy will allow us to inspect the token for specific artifacts, such as a claim or audience. Finally, the operations themselves, typically at this granular level, we apply policies that relate to caching, URL rewriting, and transformation type policies. One of the most important takeaways here is how you can use API management to support Azure Functions for serverless APIs. By doing so, you can leverage the API gateway pattern to support all of those cross-cutting concerns and remove any client-to-service interactions. 
the ability to insulate or provide a facade between the API consumers and those backend APIs can be very empowering. This feature alone will give you the freedom to refactor, version, and make changes to your APIs in a safe manner. And remember, when using Azure Functions for your APIs in the consumption plan, keep it simple. Your functions should be quick, stateless, and ideally do one thing and one thing only. You can almost think of them as a nano service. Finally, there is a serverless API workshop that we are releasing that will help you put all of this into practice. Please make note of the link and let us know what you think. Thank you for watching and take care.